Thank you for coming. It was a long commute down from the third floor. <laughs> um, so I guess I neglected to put a little title screen up there, but never mind, we'll just dig right in. Uh, in a piece of her mind, we mo mostly talk about women's conscious decisions to include in their quilts aspects of the world around them. But when we talk about the influence of science and technology, it's not the quilt makers who are thinking about technological innovation, necessarily, but their design choices were shaped by having so much fabric pouring out of the mills, uh, made in so many new colors and prints. So let me quickly run through some of the early textile innovations uh, of machinery, pretty much all happening in England. Uh, with some exceptions, that were the very first seeds of the Industrial Revolution worldwide. It really all started with textiles. I say some of the innovations because I'm leaving out a lot. Each fiber, cotton, wool, linen, and silk uh, has multiple steps in its processing, and each process um, for each fiber was eventually mechanized. Uh, so with that uh, disclaimer, First, as early as 1733, we had John Kay's patented design for the fly shuttle. So think about a woman, uh, a person weaving on a loom. Um, the weft thread or filling that you weave back and forth was wound onto shuttles and then moved back and forth under the raised threads. The weaver can only weave as wide a fabric as he or she can move her, his or her arm back and forth across the loom. Now, you did have broad cloth, but that involved having somebody on each side, and it's complicated. So, for most cases, this is the case. The fly shuttle, however, shot the shuttle between the lower threads and the raised threads, speeding up the process and making wider fabrics feasible uh, until you had, oh, is that, oh, okay, until you had very wide, um, uh, fabrics available by mid-1800s, we'll see a picture in a moment. Um, and then the problem with this, there, the problem with this, however, was that it was hard for hand labor to produce more yarn to keep up with this increased speed. It's been estimated that it took three carters to provide the roving for one spinner and three or four spinners to provide the yarn for one weaver. So that's a lot of labor before you get the yarn onto the loom. So this got out of space. I think the gremlins have been at my slides. Um, wool and cotton carding machines meant instead of needing several human carders, you could process the fiber to prepare it for spinning um, with this machinery. Um, but now you needed more spinners, or did you? Uh, two innovations combined to solve this. James Hargreaves invented and used the spinning je jenny in the 1760s until angry spinners, everyone's always afraid of being supplanted by technology, smashed his machines. <laughs> Nevertheless, he persisted because the need was there and he got a patent in 1770. It's basically a spinning wheel attached to multiple threads cranked by hands with that handle you see. At the same time, we have Richard Arkwright patenting the first water frame spinner, which connected a spinning device to gears as you'd, ha as you'd have in a grist or saw or other mill. It used water power to create stronger thread. And in the late 1770s, um, the jenny and the water frame were combined to use water power on multiple threads, as ven eventually as many as 128. The, this obviously sped things up, readying more thread for weaving. Gen then we have this nifty development, and for once it's not happening in England, as most of them were. Frenchman Joseph-Marie Jacquard um, invented what was really a proto-computer. Each card punched with a different set of holes would tell the loom what threads to raise for each weft thread to go through. You could program a complex design that previously only could have been woven by a highly trained weaver, something America was very short on. So this lessened our dependence on imports. The jacquard device made possible coverlets, rugs, and also complex dress and furnishing fabrics, some of which show up on quilts. We have a small set of jacquard cards um, on which 
I thought, I think we had a miscommunication. I thought someone else was bringing it down. Uh, someone else thought I was bringing it down. I'm going to run upstairs as soon as the, sh the, exhibit, the talk is over and bring it down if you want to stay for just a minute. We have a whole set of these jacquard cards um, and uh, scrap of the fabric, uh, printed fabrics to look at. Um, so then, if, um, then of course, all of these processes were eventually powered by steam, water, and eventually electricity. With spinning machines supplying plenty of thread and other steps in the process mechanized and sped up, and non-human power used to keep the weaving going, all you needed was less skilled workers, read women and children, um, as, to keep changing the shuttles and keep an eye on the machines, so you could have these huge factories with dozens of machines going at once. And these were incredibly uh, noisy, of course. I'm going to skip that video and keep moving on. Um, their power also made them dangerous. There were frequent work accidents, like girls' hair getting caught in the machinery and taking off large bits of scalp, losing fingers, lung diseases caused by inhaling the cotton dust. And of course, this was decades before unions and legislation mitigated this. Not to mention that cotton manufacturing depended on slave labor throughout the South and the Caribbean. All progress has its dark side. So on that cheerful note, water power meant that mills were built on rivers. So soon you had mill towns built on rivers all up and down New England, and also in Maryland on the Patapsco and elsewhere. So I'm going to skip a lot of industrialization of other processes, as I warned you, which were also underway by the time we're looking at the explosion of American quilting. But altogether, they're making more materials available and affordable to women making quilts. More directly affecting their design choices, however, are printing and dyeing developments, so let's look at those. Until just shy of 1800, the main method of printing fabric was block printing, in which each color's design had to be hand-carved onto wooden blocks. Sometimes you had some metal elements um, added in these blocks. Um, some were quite small and others were larger. Um, here you can see the repeat of the design outlined on this whole cloth quilt here and on this uh, segment of a dress fabric and that block is about yay big. Um, and you can see this is quite a large repeat on that um, length of fabric that gets cut up uh, and put into this quilt. Mm -hmm. Um, you can stretch out several yards at a time on a long table, and when the fabric is done, you can move it along and across the top there, but before you can fold it up on the floor down there at the right, each color has to dry. Then you do the next color, carefully lining it up, and let it dry, and so on. It does not go terribly rapidly. We also had copper plate printing, in which larger plates of thin copper were engraved with designs. This produced what we call toile, short for toile de Jouy. Jouy being the village outside Paris where several of the major producers were operating. Beautifully detailed like the uh, engravings whose technology they use, but you only get one color and it's also slow. However, the roller printing machine was designed with metal sheets engraved just as copper plates were, but wrapped around cylinders. One cylinder for each color, obviously. The machine moved the fabric past each cylinder, each of which has a little tub of dye that keeps the cylinder supplied with the right amount of the dye. It's a continuous movement, and don't ask me how they get it to dry and not smudge, because that still eludes me. Um, but we have a video of how this works on a modern machine. The early ones, as you see, kind of went around this big um, cylinder or drum, and then modern ones uh, like this, and um, you see each each one has a, um, a little trough of color. Here's the light blue, here's the red, here's the dark blue, here's the green, and it just goes through and picks up as the cylinder turns. So um, at the beginning of the century, you have very small, limited color prints, uh, but they start to then get more complicated. Um, they get larger cylinders, making larger repeats, and figuring out how to do more colors. 
This kind of print was used for chair seats, as you can see, and curtains and beds. Um, do go look at our bedroom, um, our period room on the first floor with its bird print hangings. It's the very first uh, room you see after you go past sort of the ballroom towards our period rooms. Um, and quilters could also cut out the flowers for their appliques. Um, Catherine Garnhart, whose quilt is in the botany section, it's the big you know, flower basket center chintz cutout quilt, Catherine Garnhart even used the capitals on the column of one of these pillar prints um, to create that fruit basket that you see. By the 1830s, roller printed cotton fabrics and wools too are rolling off the looms, making a vast array of colors and designs available to the quilt designer, from tiny monochrome prints to larger floral ones. And here you can see a wide array of different um, styles and prints. Here are just a few pages from a sample book from the mid-1830s, and this is an American factory. So we're rapidly catching up to Europe in what we can produce. In 1830s and 1840s quilts, we often see dozens of fabrics in just one quilt. I counted over 40 fabrics in this quilt pictured here, which is not the hexagon in the exhibit. But the quilt top on the frame in the exhibit, shown here, also has over 40. This one is even more remarkable because so many of its fabrics are within a narrower color range, the emphasis on browns and tans. So as we start to talk about colors, let's look at the surge in dye technologies in this era. Dyers and scientists were constantly working on improving dye recipes to get a wider range of hues and shades and tints in every color, even before the advent of chemical or aniline dyes in mid-century. I begin with this late 18th century quilt to emphasize that it's not that they didn't have bright or vivid colors before, they did. And a good deal was already known about combining dye sources such as cochineal and madder for red, fustic for yellows and browns, indigo and woad for blues, with various mordants or fixing agents to get quite a lot of colors and shades and various, you know, differentiations of blues and so on, but not quite the variety or vivid quality they achieved after 1800. Moreover, one critical thinking thing was lacking, a good, solid green dye. To get green, you had to dye or print yellow and blue in two stages or steps. So in the 1800s, the search was on for a color fast, one step green. Here's a page from Samuel Dunster's dye recipe book from 1830, which is in the Rhode Island Historical Society, which I paged through last year. Um, you see he's experimented with a variety of recipes and shown what colors he's gotten with slight variations in each of these um, greens and so on. So let's go through the rainbow using Dunster's dye books as an example of what's going on. So uh, let's start with red at the beginning of the rainbow. Uh, the other big push was to find a way to replicate the process known as turkey red. This was not a color, although it did tend to give a particular kind of classic red like the one in this quilt. Rather, turkey red was a process that had been perfected in the Near East, which the Western Europeans, with a lack of geographical accuracy or cultural sensitivity, simply dubbed turkey when in doubt. A multi-step, complex, expensive dye process for getting a really good, rich, color fast red. Now, Dunster wasn't the per first person to perfect it or anything, but do note that he lists in this page on the left eight steps, and several more are visible on the next. So it's a long process to get this color. Still, now that Europe and the US had the formula, they were able to produce these really great reds that you see quilters having so much fun with. Next, we come to chrome orange and chrome yellow. In the quilt world, the orange is often called cheddar for obvious reasons, and you'll see some quilts that make it even more obvious in a moment, but its proper dye name is chrome orange. These can produce truly eye-popping effects. The Pennsylvanians loved it. Pennsylvania Dutch design really liked bright colors, especially in combinations with each other, and you see that a lot in their quilts. Where anyone um, else would use a white background, you may see Pennsylvania quilts using cheddar or chrome uh, orange. I'm not saying these are Pennsylvania quilts. I just chose some random uh, assorted designs from online sources to give you an idea of the variety of ways quilters use these colors. 
You can do just cheddar and red. You can use it as an accent with the floral applique that is mostly red and green, or as in this detail of a signature quilt in our collection, just a few pieces in a square, nothing overwhelming. Chrome yellow is this very, very bright yellow, which also is used to da dazzling effect. Or, in a more modest way, as an accent in a red and green quilt. Uh, the, the chintz quilt in the botany section by Catherine Marky Garnhart that I've already mentioned includes chrome orange flower pots, and the other details are from two of her other quilts, um, which we um, either own or have here on loan, which use chrome yellow prints. Uh, moving on through the rainbow to green, here's Dunster's recipe for a fast green, i.e. color fast, and what he calls a chemical green. But at mid-century, greens were still a two-step process. It's not until about 1875 that manufacturers could use a one-step green, but before that, dyers had chrome green, two steps but supposedly color fast, although we have plenty of quilts whose greens have faded or washed out to show us that not everyone seems to have caught, caught on to the same magic formula. At upper left, you can see green, which is faded to blue in some of these stems. It's kind of interesting to see that clearly this quilter was, had a, maybe had a stash of several different solid greens, which probably looked close enough to being alike when she was making the quilt, but time has revealed um, her secret. Um, she was using several different stash pieces. Um, the two quilts show a typical fade to tan with photoshopping to suggest how it looked originally, the two um, on the right there. Um, and the lower left is a photo from Barbara Brackman's book, Clues in the Calico, showing how these quilt squares stacked on top of each other and stored um, in a trunk, or apparently in a way uh, exposed to light, were exposed to sunlight and over time, even the lower ones, color was lost and faded. Um, although to a lesser degree than the top. And the baskets were probably originally green. So color fast green was not a totally done deal yet. Green and black tiny prints are seen all over quilts in the middle of the century. Here are details from, from more Garnhardt quilts. She uses 16 green prints overall in her dozen or so quilts. Continuing, continuing our rainbow journey, we reach blue. And hey, it's Pride Month, so we're doing the rainbow, yay. Um, Prussian blue was one of the mineral colors that is not made directly from a plant or animal like indigo or madle, matter, excuse me, or the cochineal bug, which gave a red, but made from a chemical combination. It was made as a pigment early in the 1700s and used for house paint and artist paints but it wasn't developed into a dye that could be used in fabric until the early 1800s. This really vivid blue was also the result of another innovation, steam printing, which fixed colors with steam and made them brighter, although not necessarily color fast. Uh, these mid-century vivid royal blues are the result, and other bright colors and combinations uh, we see at mid-century were also achieved with steam printing quite often. We also need to mention the technology that developed in the 1830s, but really became widespread in the 40s. They figured out how to distribute the dye on those cylinders in varied amounts to get this shaded effect. Um, and in fashion, we call it ombre, but today quilt historians are calling it fondue. Um, I mention it here because it explodes in the fabric scene just as a fad for blue and brown or tan prints. Um, um, at the same time that blue and tan or blue and brown prints are coming into fashion. Um, so we see a lot of these shaded blues in quilts of this decade. Um, and this quilt block is in the uh, drawer in one of the cabinets in the study gallery. That, stu that cabinet that doesn't have any glass case in the, and that's in the middle of the floor, that's the costume and textiles case. So look um, in that um, for clothing. There's a quilted petticoat on the far side, and there are quilt patterns and samplers and quilt blocks on the, on the near side. So this quilt block is in one of the textile drawers. Um, Baltimore album quotes are one example um, of use of these faded or uh, fondue fabrics at mid-century. 
This is the same fabric. One bird uses the blue stripe and one uses the brown. I believe that's the case. I know that most of these were brown and blue, um, and I think these are from the same print. With all these new colors and dye processes, quilt, quilt makers went to town combining colors. So you have some, um, some chrome green and turkey red and chrome orange. You've got the Prussian blue and the chrome orange. Um, and so on. And of course, um, the uh, album quilt craze and the red and green quilt craze at the center of the, at the middle of the century. And we also have that big red and green star quilt um, really emphasize um, how using that chrome green and turkey red combines to you know, provide this wonderful fad for red and green quilts in the middle of the century. There we go, here's some more. And um, red and green, this is the one in the quilt, and then a few little pink and blue accents. Okay, now to speed this up. Uh, in the late 1850s, the first chemical dye was introduced, which introduced a whole new level of eye-popping brightness. And this silk quilt is included in the exhibit uh, to highlight this movine or fuchsia, or whatever chemical dye, dye this officially is, uh, that forms the background for these hexagons. And of course, you see more silk quilts because by the end of the century, industrialization is making it easier and cheaper to produce silks at lower price points as well as at the luxury level. This has a downside in that manufacturers often took the cheaper, lightweight, very thin, inexpensive silks and dipped them in metallic, metallic salt solutions after weaving to make them feel heavier and have a more lustrous and luxurious feeling to them. So women start lining all their dress bodices with silk, with cheap silks instead of with cotton, and they start using these silks in, um, in their outer uh, layers of clothing and in quilts, and often, and it's just a, it's a time bomb, and it's called shattered silk. It just looks like a cat got to it, and it shreds, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just a chemical reaction. Um, through the rest of the century, scientists developed chemical versions of every color in the rainbow. You don't tend to see quite this variety of colors in late century silk quilts, which, or cotton ones, which continue to be most, com most commonly made of cotton. But this does show you what colors become, became possible. If you don't want to see dresses in a quilt lecture, don't ask me to do a quilt lecture because I'm a costume historian. You're going to get some dresses. So here's red and that fuchsia or mauve and orange and yellow and green and darker green and blue and indigo and violet. Yay. There's the rainbow. So. Lastly, let's consider the sewing machine, which was marketed aggressively with layaway plans in the 1850s. It was supposed to liberate women from the tedium of sewing. Many women were still sewing much of the family's clothing, and certainly all the table linens and sheets had to be sewn together and hemmed and so on. But of course, technology always just raises the bar. It doesn't actually let you off the hook for the work you're already doing. And soon, fashions were just adding lots and lots more trim. You're going to save time in the main seams? Great, you've got more time to make all these darn little box pleats and ruffles. All right, so uh, not too many quilts used machines for their piecing initially. Ours in the exhibit is a little unusual in that it celebrates the maker's ownership of a sewing machine. You don't need to quilt a, qu a quilt that uh, closely together as that tiny little, you know, half inch grid um, has. She's just totally showing off. <laughs> Family lore said it was made with the first sewing machine in Texas. So allowing for hyperbole, perhaps it was the first in her community and she was having fun with it. And the way it's sewn is it's not a fully potholder quilt in which each square is individually finished and then sewn together, but it was, these um, white uh, squares were quilted together and then sewn to the, uh, to the basket squares, which were also quilted separately. So every, every individual square was quilted, and then it was all hemmed. Um, so let's move from technology into another area of science, botany. 
Women, fruit, flowers, and gardens have long been linked symbolically. Gardens and flowers have been used to express female fertility, or conversely, chastity, in literature and art. The medieval enclosed garden symbolized, if rather obviously, a woman's virginity. Inside it, a maiden might capture the elusive unicorn. From Eve and her fruit, never specified by the Bible as an apple, by the way, to the virgin's lily symbolizing purity, Christian symbolism used flowers. Who knows whether in some cultural, psychological way the connection between women's fertility and gardens and plants has inspired women to be associated with flowers so much that many have become women's names. Although most belong to Downton's Abbey time, few of these are in vogue right now. Go ahead and shout out the ones you see here. What, what are we seeing here? Ivy, Ivy. Ivy. Iris, Lily, Holly, Holly. Rose. yeah, Daisy. Daisy. So we've got uh, Ivy, Lily, Hyacinth, Holly. Anyone might like to watch um, Keeping Up with Appearances? Hyacinth bouquet. Yeah. That's my shout out to Hyacinth. I've done my Downton and my two BBC shout outs. Uh, Iris, Daisy, Poppy, um, uh, Jasmine. And that was meant to be Jasmine. And then uh, Rose, Petunia, Harry Potter, Marigold, and uh, Pansy. Um, okay. In medieval times and throughout the, and through the 18th century, women often kept herb gardens and made medicinal teas, essences, and ointments. The plant world has inspired the arts for millennia. Here are 3,000 years worth of pomegranates. And here are just a few appearing in some of our quilts. We actually have over a dozen quilts with applique, printed, or stuffed work pomegranates. I learned. Um, let's hear it for database searches. Which were, come to think of it, also ancient symbols of fertility, perhaps due to their hundreds of juicy pink seeds. That's not to say that's why they are used in these cases. They simply become decorative motifs. Decorative arts and women's fashions also love to use flowers as a decorative motifs, as decorative motifs, and in the exhibition, I wanted to include a few of these to show that quilt artists are taking inspiration from other arts. They're not coming up with ideas out of, forgive me, whole cloth. Like any artists, they're taking ideas from the aesthetic of their day and from the arts around them, which is my entire point of the exhibit. European explorers and traders brought flowers from the Near and Far East and later the new to them world. While these often were initially only to be found in royal gardens, some of these, such as Kew Garden, could be seen by the visiting public. And in 1787, King George's botanist William Curtis began to publish Curtis's Botanical Magazine, which is still in print. And it illustrated flowers and other plants for interested readers. Uh, and professional horticulturists and amateur botanists and gardeners. Botanical book prints and books by then were already in circulation, expensive but prized publications. And gradually, plants once reserved for these gardens made their way into the marketplace and commoners' gardens. These gorgeous, detailed, hand-colored illustrations were copied by textile designers and appeared on cotton chintzes, which England was producing to compete with the popular Indian designs. Many chintzes we find on quilts in the late 1700s and early 1800s can be traced to, to an illustration in Curtis's magazine, um, like this one, or this one. Um, and funnily enough, I had already uh, just randomly chosen these from the floworsonchintz.com website, which has lots of wonderful examples connecting botanical prints and chintzes. Um, and then I found if anyone's a member of the American Quilt Study Group, which you should be if you're interested in quilt history, their most recent newsletter has a, an article by uh, Terry Terrell, who is one of the um, authors of this website, and it discusses exactly um, Curtis's uh, prints in the quilt that this is taken from um, in the Shelburne Museum. I could not acquire a picture of the whole quilt, but you know, picture one of those big, beautiful chintz quilts. Um, 
And here uh, is the marigold, which we have a small reproduction of in the gallery. And here's the marigold in the Catherine Barnhart quilt that's in the exhibit. It's way up there at the top. Um, where Indian chintzes flora were exoticized and stylized, and Western Europe loved and copied that style too, of course, English chintz designers reveled in these botanically accurate flowers. So in the first third or so of the 19th century, reasonably well-to-do women are buying yards of different chintzes, and just as they might arrange real flowers in flower beds, planters, or vases, they're arranging chintz flowers in their own designs. Garnhart made about 10 or 12 of these um, full-size uh, chintzes. And if you look carefully, you can see some places where she's, there are seams where she's taken some flowers from one chintz and added it to the bouquet from another chintz. There's just another example. Um, in this panel in the exhibit, if you look closely between the flowers and the leaves, you'll see a light tan, medium tan, brown, and striped background. So this quilt maker has used four different chintzes. In the, late in the 19th century, this age-old association of women and gardens continued, with women uh, encouraged to arrange and paint flowers, but also to garden and even study botany. Botany was a suitable soft science for women, because, you know, we're just really not up there for the hard sciences. Um, it was nice and easy, it was safe, and its equipment was readily available and affordable. You didn't need a laboratory. It didn't require any horrid, unfeminine dissection of animals and women were already associated with flower arranging and painting. It would inspire reverence for and reflections on the beauty of God's creation, people said, so it was pious. And taking walks to gather plant specimens would be healthy, but not too athletic exercise. The problem with botany was that it was based on the Linnaean system of the sexual classification of plants, which was based on, well, sex. Robert Johnson published his new illustration of the sexual system of Carl Linnaeus in 1807, which popularized Linnaeus's concepts for a general audience, but you see how that might be a problem when considering teaching it to delicately nurtured females. Here's an illustration of the primula from Johnson's book. I don't know that it was the source of any of the many chintz primula prints you see in quilts, but it could have been. A few years later, a woman named Frances Roden wrote, quote, a poetical introduction to the study of botany, explaining rather coyly that while wanting to compose some elementary lessons, she had found, quote, the language frequently too luxuriant for the simplicity of female education. The only place you will find the word sex in Roden's botany instruction book is when she says that the female sex is devoted to a retired and domestic life, Less. So they may as well have some amusement, such as botany, to keep them from going stark raving, staring bonkers at the culturally imposed gender based limitations on their patriarchy defined lives. I do paraphrase. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, women did study botany, and many more simply enjoyed a little light gardening or just walking through their garden or cultivated gardens and taking tea in their conservatories. I can't help wondering if Sarah Vera Hewlett of Long Island loved to garden, as she so carefully drawn, stuffed, and embroidered these easily identifiable flowers on her quilt in the exhibit. Even more relevant to quilts, however, women were encouraged to sketch into watercolors and kept albums in which they copied poems and other writings or collected their friends' and relations' autographs and illustrations. This copy album is in the case in the botany section of the exhibit, and this poem is a very Victorian sentimental verse about flowers, which concludes with a metaphor of the flower meaning love. You can see the design link between album paintings and quilts in this rose wreath in, on another page of that album, and this quilt, one of hundreds and hundreds of mid-century applique quilts uh, with one or more floral wreaths like this. Um, and so, as I said at the time, exotic new plants were arriving from faraway places and had been for centuries. Um, and horticulturists were developing new varietals of old favorites. These blooms found their way into American gardens and onto quilts. 
We don't have any of these in the exhibit, but after the Mexican War, we saw cactus and poinsettia plants appearing in quilts, which we believe were brought back by soldiers. It's not that nobody had ever seen these before, but they weren't commonly known. So they were new and exotic, and when we see them, it's often in conjunction with blocks that otherwise refer to the Mexican War. More commonly, we see moss roses on quilts with their characteristic fuzzy appearance depicted with embroidery, sometimes done in green wool for extra fuzziness. The moss rose was a type of rose new on the market, though um, known, as I said, in royal gardens um, earlier. In researching 19th century American nursery catalogs, I couldn't find these roses offered to American consumers before the mid-1830s. And by the early 1840s, we see them on quilts. The quilt in this, this quilt in the exhibit that I'm showing you detail of, up, oh, well, it's the it's the big red and green album quilt in the bottom section. Um, the moss uh, that quilt has five blocks uh, with embroidered moss roses, and they're symmetrically placed, mostly immediately surrounding the center block. Um, and it seems to me the coordinator of this album quilt project may have been giving pride of place to the moss roses. The Rembrandt tulip, with its combination of yellow and red, originally caused by an aphid-borne virus, was valued for its beauty and cultivated in a disease-free varietal in many different colors. The yellow and red version can be found on many applique quilts in very simplified form. We should also take a look at the plants we think we're seeing in quilts. Quilt historian Virginia Viss, who's done years of research into Baltimore album quilts, suggests what we've been calling laurels, seen in many versions in many album and other quilts, are really no such thing. Uh, laurel wreaths are another Greco-Roman motif, um, used as a crown, a prize, or just a framing device in decorative arts. But this block inexplicably has stems with leaves that are green near the bottom and red on the last few leaves at the top. Laurels don't do that, but Photinia do. And the Photinia plant is, as Virginia points out, well suited to the Maryland climate where this block appears on so many album quotes. Similarly, textile historian Deborah Craig consulted with botanists at Longwood Gardens in Delaware to ask whether the flower in this chintz, which we've been calling a camellia all these years, looks like a camellia. The flower looks similar, but camellias have smooth, shiny leaves with edges that are, a little googling told me, called denticulate, or very finely toothed. The flower petals are all rounded too, and the trunk is quite straight and smooth. The tree peony, however, has more pronounced edges to the leaves, serrated or sawtoothed. The petals are similarly shaped, um, as in they're more um, denticulated, and the trunk is a bit knobby. So Deborah concludes that probably the chintz designers were trying for a tree peel peony, not a camellia. I'm not necessarily advocating that we should start calling these Vitinia blocks or tree peonies to try to rename quilt designs whose names are widely accepted as standardized is um, only going to confuse everybody, but it's worth knowing the possible botanical source. Or consider the princess feather, this is our last example, corruption of prince's feather, which we all used to assume referred to the Prince of Wales' as ostrich plumes, as seen in the Prince of Wales emblem, whoever the current prince um, may be. And it's, it's seen in women's traditional court dress, with three white ostrich feathers always in the head, headdress. But as Carol Gable delineates in her Uncoverings article in American Quote Study Group's uh, journal, the name comes from the prince's album by emblem by way of its also being a species of the amaranth plant. Another species is Love Lies Bleeding, which has green flowers, which may help explain the alternating green and red, red fronds in so many of the prince's feather quilts. So as you see in the example here um, that is folded in the chest and you just see one of the um, blocks in the exhibit, it's quite stylized, but you can see the feathery plumes and the, you know, the waving kind of plumes. So it doesn't just look like you know, a Pennsylvania design on a barn. It's actually meant to be um, referring to the prince's feather amaranth plant, which was also a popular plant at this time. 
and it's actually one of the very few 19th century quilt designs for which we have an official name. Mostly they just, either there was a local name for something or there just wasn't a name. Not, you know, people tend to say, what's the name of that quilt um, pattern? And, you know, the 19th century quilters didn't really name all their patterns, but this is one of the earliest quilt patterns for which we do have a name. Um, so that kind of covers all of the ones in our botany um, section, and I gave you some other examples. And I think I've thrown a lot of science at you, but at least we ended with some pretty flowers. And I'd be happy to take any questions. That's it.